All right. Well, we're going to get started. Just we're, we have the great honor. This is our fire short seminar, as you know. We've had some great speakers, and we're very, very fortunate to have Dr. Pierre Fisher here today. And so it's a, another exciting talk that really has an interface of you know bio aspects and engineering aspects. I think this will be wonderful. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fan to do the introduction. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to present uh, to introduce our speaker, Professor Pierre Fisher from Max Planck Institute for Intelligent System at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. Uh, Dr. Fisher directs the micro nano and molecular system lab at Max Planck, and he's a professor at the Institute of Physical Chemistry at the University of Stuttgart. He received his bachelor degree from Imperial College. London and the PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he was a postdoc at Cornell University and the Roland the Fellow at Harvard. And he um, headed a lab there for five years and uh, before he moved his lab to Germany. Um, Dr. Fisher has received a numerous number of awards, including the Fraunhofer Attract Award and the two European Union ERC grants. They are very prestigious and the World Technology Award. He um, he's also an editor board member of the journal Science Robotics and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Without further ado, um, I would like to ask everyone to welcome our speaker and the and the floor to him. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for the invitation and the chance to visit Austin to see the campus for the first time, speak to faculty and enjoy the good weather here. Uh, and uh, I was very interested to see that at this uh, faculty and university, careful, you're going to pull the table over, right? Um, there is uh, research in various aspects that I think relate to the things that interest us. And uh, so I'd like to give a selection of some of the work we do. I'd like to also say that I'm actually in the process of moving. So um, I will be very soon in Heidelberg. I will also be again at the Max Planck Institute, but now it's called for medical research. And I will be at the University of Heidelberg where there is a whole new institute to do the kind of things that I enjoy, which is this sort of systems engineering aspect at the small scale. Um, then, a uh, word of thanks to students and postdocs. This is the current group. Uh, we are very interdisciplinary. So we have physicists, chemists, engineers of all different disciplines, and we try to mix the things up. And of course, the funding sources. And um, I've actually turned it around because unusually, usually sort of ultrasound is something we got into fairly recently and acoustics. It's doesn't tend to be uh, many faculty that do it, but then I discovered here there is, so I turned it around. So I'm going to start with um, ultrasound and related topics. And then in the last part, I'll talk a little bit about our nano propellers. So um, the idea is to build things, actuate things, move things at very small length scales and observe them at the same time. That's the spirit of it all. And um, let me start with the projects related to ultrasound doesn't need much of an introduction, but you know that our sound range that we hear is sort of hundreds of hertz to kilohertz. And at the higher frequencies, which is beyond the uh, audible range, 10 kilohertz or so, we start to look at ultrasound and there are different things that you're familiar with, like echolocation by bats, they use this, or in your car, when you hear the beeping sound, that's a 40 kilohertz distance measurement, that's the same principle using echolocation. And then at even higher frequency, that's also the frequency that will We'll, we'll look at both ranges, but we'll also look at this higher range. That's um, something that you get uh, in medical ultrasound, megahertz or so, which is typically used in imaging. But I, this is mechanical engineering, right? So we're not gonna do observational stuff. We're gonna switch to actuation. We wanna do things with this sound. And uh, one simple stuff, thing that you know is cleaning, ultrasound bath, right? Vigorously cleaning stuff. You can kick, you can cut things. So cheese in a factory, or this is a black forest gato. I live in a black forest. You don't want to cut it with a knife and squish it. You use an ultrasound knife. You can use even higher power and you can do welding. So you can get very high power. People are thinking of haptic displays. So you can use and 
get feedback that's interesting. It's not quite working just yet that well, but it's an interesting direction. You can take more power and you can destroy molecules in solution like fragments of DNA or even kidney stones in litocracy, litotripsy, sorry. Uh, and even uh, more advanced is probably this guided high intensity focused ultrasound, which is used in, in surgery. Um, these are using sound to exert a force or do something. And uh, I would like to ask the same question, whether we can manipulate position and do things at very small scales with the sound and whether we can do it in a wireless way. So can we take the sound, let it propagate and then use it to actuate things. And uh, it's a little unusual. And what we'll be using are micro bubbles. And uh, people are familiar with micro bubbles because they're used as contrast agents. They scatter the ultrasound very, very well. So in medical imaging, you use ultrasound as a contrast agent. And following the pressure that is impingent on a micro bubble, it will start to oscillate and it can then uh, absorb energy and uh, it can also uh, scatter it. And I would like to use the bubble and um, ask two engineering problems. Can you take a robot arm and move it in multiple degrees of freedom without needing wires, no wires, no electrical cables, no control wires, no pulleys? Can we use ultrasound to move a robot arm? Uh, can we use ultrasound to position things at centimeter scale from a distance with high accuracy? And then finally, I would like to um, talk about the use of ultrasound to try and uh, assemble objects. I don't know why this stupid thing is not going away, I'm sorry. Um, so the first part is an application and it came from a medic that was in our lab. And uh, this person has uh, come with the following problem. So in certain cases in medical applications, you want to steer something like an endoscope. And this was a urologist, he got a grant and he spent a year in our lab. And the thing is that you sometimes need to inspect, for instance, a bladder or a kidney and you need to bring in a tool from the outside and the tool is usually bulky and you can imagine that the way it goes in can be rather unpleasant. So the smaller the tool, the better it is. And his particular application was ultrasound imaging of the bladder and some people have bladder cancer and you need to do this on a very frequent basis and imagine you need to do and bring in this tool very unpleasant. And um, these tools are rather big. So this is several millimeters in diameter there uh, that you need to bring in and it needs anesthesia and it's very painful and unpleasant. Um, what is the engineering problem? The engineering problem is that you need to look around and you need to bring a signal in and bring the signal out. So you need to do a lot of stuff in a small space, right? And the question is, can we develop something that is wireless? Uh, why, I'm gonna tell you in a minute wireless and that's very soft. And uh, uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, um, I don't know why this thing is not going down here, sorry. Uh, we wanted to bring in an endoscope uh, to look around the bladder and we thought we'll use the smallest possible camera that we can get which is a nan-eye camera it's a one by one millimeter camera it has about 250 by 250 pixels and the only cable we'll want to have there is the one that we need to talk to the camera and get the signal out that's the one we cannot get rid of but we don't want to have extra cabling um, and now imagine you need to look around. So you can have pulley systems. That's how most endoscopes work. If you want to have one direction, you need two pulleys, left, right, up, down, two, four, and then you get to very quickly four, six wires. If you have six wires plus your electronics, this thing gets bigger. We want to be small. So can we get rid of the pulley? You can do electrical, but you need a power cable. You need a control cable. Same problem, different degrees of freedom multiple cables. So again, we're talking about something bigger. So we thought we'll can try something unusual and we want to come up with an actuator to have an arm that can look around in many degrees of freedom, but we don't want to have any cables. And we thought we'll use a bubble. That's a bit weird, right? Uh, so how would that work possibly? So if you have a cavity, let's say in a material where you have a gas, and you bring in an ultrasound and it's resonant, it's like a little organ pipe. If it's resonant, then this gas will expand resonantly with the pressure. If the resonance oscillation of the pressure, the bubble will push against the liquid. If it pushes against the liquid, the other side is hard, there will be a recoil force, right? Newton, pushing against something, you'll be pushed back. If it's pushing against the fluid, there is a recoil force. 
And in fact, there is a known phenomenon, which is st streaming, streaming. So the fluid will really be pushed away and it will, uh, with high speed, if you're resonant, it will be pushed away. And, th and then there's this, this recoil force. But the force are, is, is very small. So one bubble gives you something like 100 piconewtons, right? That's very, very small. So that's too small to do anything useful. And um, how can you possibly do more with this? And this was a PhD project of 10Q. And so the next step was, all right, let's make an array. Use photolithography, deep etching, make little organ pipes, each one coated with a hydrophobic material, fill it with gas, and then excite the whole lot, right? Can we increase the force that we can get that way? And here are some particles in a fluid. The ultrasound doesn't need to be directional. It can come in from the side. This is the surface here. It has these little openings, the cavities, and you can see the streaming is really vigorous. It really pushes a lot. This will go at tens of centimeters per second. This uh, fluid will be pushed away. And here on the right, you see a slowed down movie of the fluid transport. Okay, so it's pushing the fluid away and hence you get a recall force. But uh, a, a slight problem there is that you need to have enough fluid to push away. If you imagine you have a large area and push away the fluid, you need to bring in more fluid, right? And this means there is actually a transport problem. So uh, we, did a, we were able to get some increase in the force, but it wasn't good enough. And uh, here you see the speed. So it's actually pushing here with something like four centimeters per second. Now the trick is let's sacrifice some of these little bubbles and basically make a large opening, make through holes. That can now push the fluid from behind and we are now up in 14, 15 centimeters per second flow speeds that you can get here and if you add up all these little tiny little bubbles, I started with 100 piconewtons, we're now in a fraction of a millinewton. And that's the force you need to carry this little camera, right? That's roughly the force we need to actually carry this camera. And so the nice thing is uh, we don't need to direct it. We can use a normal uh, device. So the power levels are totally safe. We can bring in this ultrasound. It can travel freely through the fat and whatever else there is to the location it needs to be. And you can choose the resonance because these resonances are relatively sharp. So you make one whole diameter 100 microns, the next one you make 150 microns, 200 microns, blah, blah, blah. You have very nicely separated resonances. So within um, here is, is 20 microns, 40, 60, 80, et cetera. So we can easily get four or five degrees of freedom. All you need to do is you tune your frequency, right? So here's a little demonstration. This is only two millimeters in diameter. This is a rotor. It has two different uh, plates with different hole diameters. There is a torque because it's off the center. Uh, it's free, there's no connection. I mean, it's, it sits on a little, uh, on, on a wire here, but it's free, there's no connection. And just by changing the frequency, you can make this thing spin left, uh, change the frequency, it will actually spin right. To demonstrate that a little clearer, uh, we've built a little uh, surface here. This is just so annoying. I don't know why it does that. Oh, there we go. I'll move it, try to move it out of the way. I'm sorry about this. Zoom is annoying. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyway, so we made a little um, a tank here and we made a little device and uh, we're just steering it freely in the tank by choosing from the outside different frequencies and sometimes one frequency and it will push one way, then you activate another surface, it will go up, down, and there you have perfect control, no wire, no nothing, and all you need to do is change the input frequency, right? So here is our little bubble actuator and it goes in a, in a surface. Now let's come to the application. Here's a robot arm. This is just a tweezer holding it. There is no wire, it's only holding it and it's moving in 3D because each surface will have a different frequency and you can push it one way or another way. And this is in comparison, this is a one millimeter in diameter. This was the four millimeter endoscope that we're trying to beat, right? And so um, you can steer it by choosing the frequency. So even though the bubble seems rather pathetic, uh, you can get the force up. And finally here, this is in a rabbit bladder. Uh, this is the nan eye camera, and this is the image it's transmitting. I don't know what it means, but supposedly if you know what you're doing, you can watch the surface of it and move it, uh, move it around just simply by uh, tuning the ultrasound frequency. So uh, that's a little, little warm up 
project uh, to see if we can find uh, different ways of actuating things at small scale. And um, I'll continue very briefly in this theme uh, before I come to uh, assembly and I'll choose an even more obscure effect, which is called the secondary Bjergnes force. And it's even weaker. And uh, we try to see if we can also make it bigger and turn it into something useful. So recently we have tried to review this uh, literature in the context of using ultrasound to make smart material systems, um, really in all sorts of different contexts. Uh, so that if anybody's interested in this, this is like an article fairly with lots of references in chemical review. And um, one peculiar effect that uh, hasn't been uh, really used much is this uh, secretary Bergness force. So what is that? We're again talking about a bubble, We're again talking about a pressure wave as is an ultrasound wave. And if you make this uh, structure, for instance, smaller, then the size that is would be resonant at a particular frequency, then the smaller bubble will be pushed to high pressure and the larger bubble, so it's larger than the structure at this particular frequency, a bubble has a very unique resonance frequency. So if you make it larger, the frequency shifts. If you make it smaller, the frequency shifts. So if you make it bigger than what it would be, it will actually go to low pressure. That's what's known as a force on an isolated bubble, gradient of the pressure and the volume, that's the primary Bjergnes force. What is the secondary thing now? The secondary thing is even more peculiar. So you take two bubbles and you excite them with ultrasound and one bubble will be re-emitting because it's oscillating as will be the other. So the second bubble will see not just the field coming in, but it will see the emitted one from the nearby bubble. So it's a very weak thing, typically 10 piconewtons if you take isolated bubbles, so they can see each other, but it's a ridiculously small effect typically. Um, this means that each oscillating structure generates a new wave so that the nearby bubble will see the incoming wave plus the wave from the nearby structure. If um, both the size of the bubble and the distance is much, much less than the wavelength, uh, which is typically very large. I mean, we're talking wavelengths that are tens of centimeters. So these things are much, much smaller, 100 micron or so. Then the force goes as one over R squared. And that's quite interesting because that's uh, already something that would be rather long range. And we're gonna exploit this and uh, we're gonna do the same thinking. We're gonna ask, let's forget two isolated ones. Let's have many, right? Let's see what happens if we have many. The details will depend on a lot of geometrical factors, not just the size of them, but also their distance, their arrangement. And so I'm just gonna give you a qualitative uh, idea. So let's imagine you have one, bubble that's now not talking to another one, but to a linear array. Then you can bump up this force and we're already now at 100 piconewton. You can do uh, even better. And what you need to do is you need to sum all the contributions between all the different structures. You can have two linear arrays, then you've bumped it up even more. And finally, you can make uh, like a lattice, two lattices. And then we can again, get into the hundreds of micronewtons. And that's starting to get useful. That's now you can do things which you couldn't do before. Um, and uh, an interesting observation is it can, in certain instances, be stronger than magnetic forces. Magnetic forces, imagine each bubble replaced with a lump of material that's magnetic and magnetizing it. So having tiny little magnets, the same size as the bubble, the magnetic dipole force goes as one over R to the three, whereas this acoustic radiation one goes as one over R squared. So it has a, a longer range. And if we um, get this stupid thing out of the way, then uh, we can see that as we separate things, the blue line is the acoustic one. Well, I think that's probably too much experimental stuff now. Let, let me go on, it's all right. These things never work out. So um, if we increase the separation, then we see the blue line, the acoustic force will actually be stronger than the magnetic one. So an array of iron oxide particles, which have the same size, all magnetized, will be weaker than the acoustic force. And similarly, if you increase the magnetic particles, because it's shorter range, you get less addition of forces. And so the total force is also weaker than in the acoustic case. So therefore, um, this is kind of 
uh, promising that you can do something. And now I'll just show you qualitatively what happens. So what we want to do is we want to make a surface and we have another one somewhere, another structure. These are all centimeter scale. The separation is centimeter. These bubbles are something like 100 microns, these cavities. And the wavelength at, that we're going to use is going to be 45 centimeters. So it's much, much larger than this thing, 50 times um, larger than this structure. And we want to use it to wirelessly actuate these and push it, position them to sub wavelength control. We want to have 10 micron level control, even though our wavelength is like half a meter. And so here, viewing from above, this is a structure which has bubbles and underneath is a bubble switching on the sound at three kilohertz. This is half a meter. They will find each other even though they're centimeters apart. So you can actually position them. Here is an image. You see through these structures how they will have an attractive force and how they will find the minimum. And you can see this bubble is about 300 microns. So the positioning is something like 10 micron accuracy with a wavelength of half a meter, right? And it's totally contactless. So even this very bizarre Bergness force can do some fun stuff. If you make the structure a little asymmetric so it never totally finds the minimum, then it will come into position, carry a little bit of momentum, and it will go out of a local minimum into the next one. And you can make a rotary motor by just having a constant uh, irradiation with an ultrasound wave. So um, this is just a little pretext that you can um, sometimes discover some fun things in very old and peculiar uh, little physics effects. So that was um, a little story about uh, how to actuate things at very small scales, We're talking small forces and things. Uh, another topic we got very interested in is to um, look at uh, the pro projection of ultrasound into interesting patterns. So normally you take a ultrasound wave and you have a plane transducer and this vibration will go through the medium, right? It's just everywhere and you don't do much. Even for medical imaging, you, you are very good at picking up fine differences, but you just generally typically send in rather simple fields. Can we do better? So in light, we have projectors, right? You are looking at beautiful images with lots of different pixels. Why can I not project sound like this, right? Why can I not have pressure somewhere and not somewhere else? Why does it always have to be so uh, simple? And you can do better by having more transducers. So if you have multiple transducers and waves that you combine, you can benefit from the interference of multiple waves. And if you have lots of them, you, and you tune the phase of each of them, the wave interference can do something interesting, like for instance, give you a focus or so, right? But if you now want to do something, and this is what my PhD student Kai Melder wanted to do, he wanted to project this P stuff. If you want to do this, uh, you can imagine you would need an incredibly large number of sound sources. So if you think about pixels, right? If you have, at best, you can do a hundred transducers, and that's already very expensive, a lot of equipment, and it will be a lot of painful work. Imagining, it's not quite the right analogy, but imagining drawing a painting with a hundred dots, it's rather trivial, right? But how do we do better than this? And the idea uh, that Kai Mele had, this, this is his name here, was uh, let's try and explain this, and he wanted to do better. And so we were wondering how we can do this in optics. And on optics, of course, one way of doing this very nicely are holograms, complicated interference patterns of uh, waves. And so can we come up and make a hologram of sound? That was the question. And uh, this is now really, really trivial. So we use one sound transducer, and we use a simple piece of plastic up here, 3D printed, that we place in front of the transducer. And that's all you need. And it, it works like this. Imagine that this surface is uh, structured, is 3D printed. Some bits are thicker and some bits are thinner. If there's a plane wave that comes from below, everything is in phase in the plane wave. Now the wave in one particular location will go through your phase plate and it will travel through a thin bit and then enter the water. The neighboring part might go through a thick bit 
and then enter the water. Because there is a sound speed difference between the plastic and the water, it means that the two ways will accumulate phase differences. So just by fixing the thickness, we can fix the phases at each pixel. We don't need lots of electronics. All we need is a structure that has different thicknesses and thereby by 3D printing, we can get lots and lots of them on a very small space. So what did he do? He took the image. He defines the region where this image is supposed to appear. There is the transducer. And then you need to define how the plate looks like so that you get this diffraction image. And you can do this by iterative methods, analogous to optics. We're using an iterative angular spectrum algorithm because in ultrasound, you're near, near field. And um, you basically iterate. You keep the amplitude here and uh, you adjust the phase there. And then when you compute this, say 20 times or so, uh, you usually get a very good result. And it tells you if your wave had this phase distribution, that's from pi to minus pi, it will diffract into this image. Then you take this phase and calculate what the corresponding thickness profile is in your plate. You 3D print it, plonk it on your transducer. Here is very trivial. We just use a commercial one. We already have 15,000 pixels now, by the way. And this is the actual pressure image that Kai got in the solution. So this is not an image that you can see. This is taking a measurement and each pixel has a pressure. And you can see this is drawn here is like 30 kilopascal or 20 kilo kilopascal and there's no pressure. So you can project pressure and pressure gradients, you know, can give forces. So that's what we think is exciting because now you can define forces very, very nicely. And uh, so can you do better foci, for instance, for medical applications or in surgery? And it's not totally obscure. I didn't just put this here because one likes to put medicine to justify things. Um, there is actually a group in Spain that has taken this idea and has um, printed a hologram to compensate in a human patient. There is a skull difference in thickness. So your skull is not a nice structure, but it's a little uh, corrugated thing, thicker, thinner, and that is causes aberration to your image so that it blurs out, it doesn't look nice. So by compensating for the skull and putting it onto the high power transducer, you can then get a nice focus in, uh, in, a, in a patient. And this is actually the Spanish group and is now work, moved to Columbia University and it's gonna be trialed in, in, in a medical application. But I wanna stick with engineering. So, um, the structures that I've shown you can be used to define the phase of a wave that will diffract and form a pressure distribution in space. But it's static because we make the structure, we make the plate, and that's it. We'll always get the P stuff. We always get the focus that will be the same elliptical focus, but you would like to do this dynamically. So this guy up there, this projector, does it dynamically, right? It does change because when I click here, we have a new image. Uh, can we think of a projection mechanism that can now use this idea of having like a hologram type so we get high resolution, but can we do it dynamically, right? That's what we want to do. Not a fixed image, but one that changes over time. And this is getting uh, tricky. This is a difficult problem. So in light, you have millions of pixels, right? And you have various projectors like the projection mechanism that is used in displays on our screens, they will use the fact that as the light wave travels through a pixel on your screen, changing the order of some molecules between ordered pneumatic to isotropic changes the refractive index. And so you get a phase difference according to that, right? And um, that is one way of how you can get a phase difference. Do you want to calculate how much you need? If you need say two pi, that will give you a lot of freedom in your design of your uh, interference patterns. Your wavelength is 500 nanometers, 0.5 microns. The refractive index difference between aligned and isotropic is 0.1. So all you need is a five micron thick layer of your molecules. And that's easy to do as we know, because otherwise we wouldn't have these screens, right? Mm -hmm. Can we do this with sound? Now with sound is in a way nice that it doesn't interact with stuff. But that's, of course, a major bummer if you want to build things that should interact with it. So most materials look exactly the same to the ultrasound. The differences are very minute. So to illustrate this, if we use this kind of plastic 
and we want to get a phase difference between plastic and water of two pi, and you want to actuate one, you would need to make one a millimeter bigger. Now, if we are at ultrasound, we're talking wavelengths of hundreds of microns. Now we need to make a device that has hundreds of microns footprint with millimeter change in, in height. This is not something that anybody that I know can do. There is really a lack of actuation in this length scale. It's really tricky. Picometers and piezos is all great. And very large things is also great. In the middle, it's really, really tricky. But let's switch to another one. Actually, this projector uses a different device. It uses a mirror. It uses a MEMS mirror system, right? So each little mirror is electrically actuated. And if you want the light, it will switch into one position. And if you don't want this red, green, or blue, it switches to another position, right? So basically, the mirror switches on or off each little uh, color at each little pixel. That's how you get these million pixel type devices. What is the analogy? We need to now come up with a device that can locally block and unblock sound, okay? And the nice way to block sound, and we're back with a the theme, is to use a bubble. A 20 micron thick layer of gas will have an extinction coefficient of 10 parts in a million for uh, ultrasound. So it's exceptionally good. So all we need, we need to be able to have local areas where we can block and unblock by creating gas and removing it. So that sounds a little easier than making a material a one millimeter thicker. And so this is a project by uh, Xu Chao Ma. And um, the idea is we have little pads and each pad either gives a bubble or doesn't, generates it and we can remove them and then we can update this. The bubble pattern will define a hologram and that will define the sound wave that goes through it to make the image. And the way we did this uh, is we actually collaborated with people who uh, made a CMOS device with gold electrodes. We have 10,000 gold electrodes. And each one of these electrodes, here is the device, centimeter by centimeter, um, is a source for electrochemistry. So by having each gold pad wired, we can do electrolysis of water, we can generate a gas locally there, right? And so sound goes through stuff very easily. So you just send it through your CMOS chip, it couldn't care less. And on the other side, you have your electrode and there you can block it or unblock it depending on whether you have gas generation or not, okay? And this is what Shishao did. Here you see the gas bubbles generated, right? By this method. And then it will go through and will generate the images. So here is a, a local generation of these bubbles. And then we can even watch what the ultrasound does at the other end because we can see its effect on the water surface and moving some particles around. So we now have a method of updating this because you can remove the bubbles by blowing them away and then you make a, a new uh, structure. But this is not quite as stable yet as we would like it. It's not quite there that this is going to be a device like this little thing on the ceiling. So we wanna do better. And actually very pleased to say that we're collaborating here with Emma Fans Group and Hyung Yo has been in the project and Shishou Ma, he, he, he's done uh, this. And we were trying to see if we can get away with this CMOS device, right? It's a pain, you need to make it, it costs a lot. Let's do it simpler. And the idea is we're gonna use exactly this kind of projector, which already gives us beautiful images. And we are going to use the light pattern to go onto a surface. And whenever there are photons, it'll be conductive right there. And when there are no photons, it's not conductive. So we have a photoconductor and we can have really high resolution because this is 1 million pixels. So we can project 1 million pixels on the surface and we have a photoconductor with very high resolution. And we can say here is where we want this electrolysis to happen, right? And so um, here's some images. This is like light on and these are the bubble patterns and they are calculated to be what you see in a top insert. So basically the light pattern on the surface is generating bubble patterns, which you see here in bright because they scatter more light. The ultrasound goes through this thing and generates focus. And in this particular case, we have changed the distance between two focal points so we can move a, a beam and steer it and have some uh, focal um, changes. And so we're working on this. 
And our hope is, of course, at some point that we'll really have a live movie, a pressure movie, which we can project into solution and then we can really do things locally by defining the forces and stuff. What can we do with these patterns? And that's another area uh, of research that we are very excited about. And the other area is that you can manipulate things with these, right? So here is a movie from a Japanese group that has a speaker and a reflector. And the idea is if you combine these waves, you can have high pressure zones, low pressure zones. And this is now in air. Um, and you know these effects from, from organ pipes or from, from vibrating surfaces. They're trapping polystyrene particles, right? So wherever there's a high or low pressure, you, these things will move and you can exert a force and the force you can control by your wave. But these are very symmetric things because they are re resonators. These are reflectors, these are resonators. These are very highly symmetric things. And so you can align them in a very symmetric way. But we can get away from this because we, I just told you about the acoustic hologram, right? So let's make an object, in this particular case, a bicycle by the method of exerting a force. Let's go from air into liquid. And what we have here is the faceplate. We need to put this faceplate on a simple $5 transducer. That's all you need. Put this little plastic plate on that costs you a dollar to print and put it in liquid. And then uh, we put some particles in there. And depending on the elasticity and the density of the particles, they will be pushed to high pressure or they will be pushed to low pressure, but this is defined. And so we can go into a soup. This is in the soup, we're watching from above. And all you need to do is you switch on your sound. And in one instance, you have all your stuff assembled, right? In this particular case, this is one shot assembly, no 3D printing, nothing needs to hop from one point to the next. It's the pressure is on, you're watching this live, this is not sped up or anything, and these are the actual uh, particles in, in solution. And why do, do we like this? Well, we're not going to build a bicycle like this, of course, it would be a bit silly, right? And uh, uh, But, and it's very good with cells. So the idea now is, can we have complicated patterns and can we directly in a suspension with cells move them so that we can make interesting objects if you have to print cells the cell would generally be very unhappy because you have to squish it through a nozzle you would have to keep it in some strange containers and down pipes and whatever we just have a suspension we don't even touch it all we need is need to bring in the sound from the outside and hopefully we can assemble these cells right and once they're in place uh, we can use the material that's where the cell is in. It could be a hydrogel and it can thicken and it keeps them right there where they should be. And then they can go off to the growth chamber. And here are some human colon cancer cells. This is a focus and you see the cells. This is five times sped up, but these are the cells moving into a spheroid. There's something that biologists like to use for testing. And we were really amazed that this worked because we didn't expect it. Because the fact that you're exerting a force relies on a contrast. The air bubble has an incredible contrast. Gas is very different than liquid. A solid particle like in the bicycle has a different behavior than fluid and water. But a cell is really just water from a, a acoustic point of view. So why did this work so well? It's just water in water. It should be no really strong force. So that's why we're really surprised by this. But I showed you at the beginning the arm the arm was using streaming. So if you're going into megahertz sound waves, they do get absorbed by the fluid. So the sound wave will also transport the fluid. So we can benefit from this because it can carry the cells towards the region where there is the focus. And then the focus catches it up and keeps the cell where it should be. So it worked, doesn't, doesn't happen very often. It actually worked better than we thought it should. And so here, uh, Shishao's Ma project, this is from 2019. You see, um, sorry, I stopped. Let me go one back. Uh, this is a, is a line that's assembled. And this is a real Petri dish that real biologists use with real cells. And all we need to do is we need to acoustically couple it and it forms a Pac-Man here. And these are cells, right? In the actual device. So we can assemble these in situ 
by just um, applying the, the right forces and uh, thereby assemble things. Now, we are very, very close to doing this in 3D, but uh, we're not quite yet fully done. Uh, but we can already do simple 3D structures. In, 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 so we have multiple transducers, we bring them together, we calculate the object that we want, and then we have a 3D pressure pattern, and then we just put the cells in and they assemble. But this is work in progress, and of course that's where we want to end up and be, uh, in, in a position to assemble objects in one shot using cells in a real uh, fluid environment in 3D. Yeah, so here are some examples and we can check they actually live and they grow and they're happy. And so that's what we were not allowed to publish the Pac-Man. Uh, that was a real disappointment because some lawyer in Japan holds the copyright. And so then you really have a problem. So Shisha was very smart. He actually chopped it, the image in half. And we, we in the paper, you find half, it looks like two mountain bits. <laughs> It was our Pac-Man. So I hope, even though I had to sign something for the UT Austin that I own the copyright, so I've probably now caused myself a big problem here. Um, I hope I don't end up in jail. Right, so I'll totally switch gears. I'm almost done, last, um, last seven minutes or so. I will switch to even smaller and very local control and how to get materials in the nanoscale. Uh, by design. And this is something we've worked on for a while. And the motivation is the following. Um, you know that as you bring in pharmaceuticals or particles or whatever, typically they don't go where they should be going. It's very hard to reach. Body has a lot of protective layers, mucus, the skin, most skin products, you can just about throw them away because they never ever make it to where they should go. It's very, very hard for things to look, to get to the region where you want them. So some ideas are that you now take magnetic particles and um, use them as a carrier and pull them. But typically the forces are quite weak uh, and the gradient forces are really terrible. They scale terribly. If you wanted to have anything on the size of a, a, a human, it's really, really weak. And you can only pull to the outside. So it doesn't scale, it's very weak forces. So the thing that we have uh, enjoyed uh, being inspired by for, for quite some time now are these bacteria. There's actually a movie by Howard Berg from Harvard. He was uh, in another lab close by. He passed away very recently and he worked out how these bacteria really swim. And they swim by having a little molecular motor that spins this little fiber here, which is called a flagellum, and it becomes a corkscrew. So that's how the bacterium actually swims. It drills itself through the fluid. That's really what it does at this length scale. And so from an engineering point of view, it's the flagellum that does the work. The flagellum is a screw. The screw needs to be rotated and then you get rotation translation coupling as everybody knows who's taken a screw and drilled it into the wall. So can we make small screw-like structures and can we magnetize them and can we take external magnetic fields to actuate them? So this is something that we have worked on in a while. So it would be homogeneous fields. It scales much, much better. It's much more realistic to make this happen. And how do we grow these? Well, um, this thing is a little bit in the way, I'm sorry, but uh, we're using this method, which is called glancing angle deposition. It's an idea that's been around for a long time, um, but we recently worked hard in pushing this to make structures that are submicron. So how do we do this? Um, we take a material, we evaporate it, you can form a thin film. You know this, this is normal coding of materials, you make a thin film. But here in this method, in this glancing method, you take your substrate and your angle alpha is something like 85 degrees or so. So it's almost like all material will fly by. But if you have little localization spots, you can grow structures on here because the material will land on the first one. Whatever misses the first one will land on the second one. And so in parallel, you can grow nano structures isolated, separated, and if you control your substrate, you can even give it a shape, okay? And so how do we do this in the nanoscale? We actually need points where they grow. For this, we use block copolymers. So these are self-assembled, very long chain molecules. The red parts like to be in the center, the green parts on the outside because it's in an organic solvent. This is a little bit more charged. So they form like in washing up soap bubbles, they form micelles. You load the center with a metal salt. You shake this thing 
you can then drop it onto a wafer, spin code the whole solution. You get one micelle sitting next to another one, close packed. The size of the micelle is given by the size of the polymer, and you can tune how much metal salt you put in. Then after spin coating, you transfer it to a plasma chamber. The plasma chamber will burn away the organic uh, polymer, and it will reduce right there in the local center of each micelle, the metal salt to make a metal nanoparticle. So this takes a very short time uh, and you have a surface with something like 100 billion nanoparticles and you can tune them between four and 10 nanometers all in one shot and they will be our starting points for the growth. We take this thing, we put it in a vacuum chamber, we heat a material and we use the control of the substrate here to make structures. To make the helical propellers, all we need to do is we need to grow. And while we're growing, we rotate that will automatically give the helical structure. And it does that in about an hour or two. So in two hours, we have 100 billion propellers and we can tune the size, the shape, the material, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here are some of the early ones. Um, this is the same size as in the bacterium, two microns. The diameter is a few hundred nanometers and we can include magnetic material as well. And then we can magnetize part of it and we make like a little corkscrew. So here is one colored with some fluorescent dye and controlled in solution. We can just drive it around by changing the plane in which the magnetic field rotates. You can steer this thing in 3D with very, very good control, right? And because it works so well in water, we naively thought it's very trivial. All we need to do is put it in the body, boom, we are right there. But this is not as trivial. So we have now taken a wafer, we sonicate them, we release them into solution, and we can change the shape and size, and we can then use and navigate through tissues at very, very small length scales, really small length scales, because it turns out this is actually a very interesting uh, problem. You are dealing with structure, macromolecules that form networks. So you have a size advantage. If you're small enough, you can sneak through. If you're big enough, you get stuck. That's how all these protective fluids protect us. And you also have to deal with the macromolecular issues like charges and hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity to actually navigate something. And this is rather, difficult. So even though you get these structures, and even if you watch bacteria, for instance, I don't have the time running out, I'll almost be done in a few minutes, but if you watch bacteria, how they get through the mucus in the stomach to give us stomach ulcers, they are small enough to technically make it between the macromolecules, but they can't without additional chemical tricks. So they need enzymes to help them to navigate. So this is a rather delicate issue. One area we're focusing right now is we want to do gene therapy in the retina because for treatments of blindness, you need to bring a very long DNA sequence, which you cannot fit in a lenti or adenovirus is what people use. So we are thinking we might be able to build a carrier to take this, right? And so the first step was going through the vitreous, which is the fluid, in the eye before the retina. And this is a little movie that science made about our paper and you need to do a trick. The trick is we needed an extra coating. The coating is inspired from nature, which uses slippery coatings. And so we make a structure, it's magnetic, and we coat it with a medically approved perfluorocarbon coating so it doesn't adhere to the molecules. And it's small enough to then navigate between the interstitial space in macromolecules. Then we used a real um, pig eye and we used medical imaging OCT to watch these structures navigating through. And here you can see a movie. This is a swarm of them after they have traveled tens, sorry, after they've traveled one centimeter and they localize on the retina. And here you see the trajectory is very well, they're very well uh, steered. The region is a couple of millimeters and we can get them onto this site through about a centimeter uh, in the eye. And my last comment is that we also need to worry about materials. If you say you're gonna steer some magnetic structure in the eye and everybody says rightly so, my goodness, is this really a really good idea? And if you look at materials, they're either corrode when they're 
bi biologically okay, or, or, or they're toxic. You don't want to use nickel or cobalt in a body like this, or they have terrible magnetic properties. But this is a, a little bit of a wonder material here. Iron platinum, which is peculiar. You're adding platinum, which is a non-magnetic material, to iron, which is a magnetic material, and you get the strongest magnets. They're as strong as neodymium iron boron, almost as strong. These are the super magnets which you buy in the lab and you play with, right? This iron platinum L10 is almost as good, almost as good, much better than anything else. And it's not corrosive, it doesn't, it's not toxic, and it has a very high magnetic moment. But you need to make this thing. So you need to now, we need to now make little propellers, and we need to include this material in there. And you need to be in the right part in the phase diagram, the right mixing and the right annealing, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to optimize your processes. And um, this is quite cumbersome because if you imagine you had to check this, you want to do different shapes and different material composition, you would have to run to the vacuum chamber, open it, do your depositions. Like every time is a day after day after day. How do we do all this in one shot so that we can check we have gradients of material composition. We can do and check all this, get the optimum out. This is something uh, that Hannah Noah Barat has uh, included. We have uh, published this recently. So we use uh, like little small blocking parts, barriers, so that the material from one source will form a gradient. And by manipulating the direction, we can have multi-dimensional gradients of material and shape. So we can in one, method check where do we get the right property and then we can move on from there so this is sped up our process very much and this is my very last uh, comment we have included this we can anneal it we get the super duper magnetic properties we can coat gfp plasmids and with this we can even bring genetic material into cells to prove that this concept at least works in the petri dish and the next step is now that we want to take it and see if we can do something in a more realistic environment. And with this, my time is definitely up. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the acoustic fields has its drawbacks, right? You don't want to expose cells to acoustic fields, uh, sorry, uh, light fields that has a drawback to tweezers. You can at best manipulate probably 100 or so, and I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of this. And then you have to move them one by one. You have to move them, right? You have to pick them up and move them. So, I mean, it's not obvious to me that people have used, maybe you know of work that I don't know of, that you can put a cell dish where you have cells floating around, pick them up and move them with optical fields. I think that requires a lot of control. We don't need this control. All we do is we define a pressure pattern and we basically sprinkle the cells and they will, they will uh, localize there. And our structures are five centimeters by five centimeters by five centimeters. And I don't believe that an optical tweezer system is all that advantageous. It's very good at grabbing one micron thick things. It's not good at grabbing a 20, 30, 40 micron cell. So there, the acoustic field, I think, has a, has a real advantage. It has just the right, um, if you like, trapping size. It's very benign, and it can globally act, and you can make a macroscopic structure, which would, I think, be tricky with an optical system. Thank yeah. Thank you. And uh, the next thing that uh, we want to thank the speaker oh, wow. uh, for this lecture. Oh, thank this you. A wonderful lecture. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, if you have more questions, you can uh, relate the questions to me. And uh, yeah, we have to stop here.